hello and welcome to Beauty as Paths TV. We are very honored to have with us today Veena Punjani, uh, all the way from Goa, uh, from the you know the pleasant climes of Goa. Given that we are sitting here in Delhi and it's quite hot, so uh, Veena, as uh, we know, she's the one and only Veena Punjani. She has uh, she's known to be one of the top most creative uh, hairdressers in the country. Uh, Veena uh, is a graduate in economics and post that uh, she chose hairdressing um, and uh, has trained and uh, worked at uh, one of the most leading uh, hairdressing brands, worked with the, uh, the biggest hairdressing brand uh, in the world for about six years, uh, followed by another three years as, at, as creative director at uh, uh, the biggest salon chain in North India. Uh, Bina then uh, realized uh, that uh, uh, to, to actually achieve uh, those international standards and, uh, and the philosophy that she, uh, uh, that she holds dear to herself, uh, it's very important that she launch her own brand. So uh, in 2011, uh, Bina Punjani launched um, the, hair, uh, the chain of hair, uh, now a hair, uh, ch chain of hair studios called Bina Punjani Hair Studios. There are four of them in Goa now uh, at Panjim, Parvarim, Margao, and recently, just last week, she launched one at Anjana. Now, uh, in the past 10 years, the, the salon chain has achieved, uh, you know, the status of being the go-to place for be the best haircuts, hair colors, and hair services. Um, she, the, these studios also offer a line uh, or top, top of the line face treatments and allied beauty services. Besides the salons, Bina also runs Bina Punjani Hair Academy, a dedicated training institution offering international standards uh, of training in hair and makeup. makeup. And um, Bina regularly works on a wide variety of projects in fashion, film, advertising, media and bridals. So welcome to Beauty as Past TV, Bina Punjani. We are really honored to have you with us. It's always a pleasure, Ritu. I think our uh, association goes way back and uh, we've seen the industry grow, change, and I'm very happy to be a part of uh, this and thank you for having me today. Most welcome. So, Veena, we will start uh, with going back to the roots as to, you know, you choosing hairdressing and the journey till now. If you could share some quick milestones that you think have, you know, kind of, uh, you can define the journey basically.
so I think uh, where I would start is by saying that uh, I was very clear that I wanted to do something that makes me happy. And I kept looking out for that something that made me happy. Um, and clearly, um, I don't think uh, we are prepared or were prepared to look at the options that were available at that time. So through various explorations and trying out different things, I landed on to hairdressing thinking that it's like fun and you know there's a lot of um, interaction with different kind of people and there's a lot of satisfaction but also realize that it it equally requires a lot of hard work to be very very good at what you do to be able to uh, uh, you know be ahead of the industry and to be top of the line it's not very easy so that realization uh, was something that happened to me very early on uh, when I was training, while I was training. So every step post that was um, based on that decision that I want to work uh, in the best uh, ecosystem, uh, work in, uh, you know, tough situations, try to figure out situations that, you know, are not easily, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, the times the hairdressers or people who train in hairdressing they miss that journey. And I think that journey is uh, what has made me what I am today. So uh, I would say that uh, what has really, really helped me is to stay uh, focused and stay, uh, you know, grounded um, while at the same time being able to uh, be creative and be very sort of expressive about what I want to do and how I want to do things. So yeah, that's... Uh, the starting point of my journey and uh, in the course of this journey as a woman were you uh, were there any specific challenges were there any hurdles that you think could have happened only because you were a woman yeah i think if i reflect uh, back i would definitely say yes but luckily i didn't think of it as such that time because then i think it's 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 a little complex in the sense that if you end up being a victim, then you don't fight it. For me, I did not, uh, you know, let that enter into the system, though, you know, we were told that. And again, different markets are different for female hairdressers or female hairstylists. So, you know, clearly you have the hair uh, styling market, which is, you know, when it comes to uh, Bollywood or Hollywood and you know you have a lot of the gay community that benefits uh, from that because the actresses are very uh, comfortable uh, working with them and uh, it's dominated by them so they uh, at some point they can't handle uh, so I, I do celebrities as well but these are celebrities which you know, know themselves they're, they, they, they are not used to being completely pampered by the stylist so you know, there's a lot of variability in uh, different aspects. And of course, when it comes to um, somehow the, uh, the impression when I was young back 10 years ago, uh, uh, there was this whole responsible hairdresser associated with uh, the male gender at some point. That's because uh, women used to be purely creative and when they would give their opinion, it would feel like an outburst rather than being taken seriously. Um, so yeah, there were, uh, if I reflect, there were uh, points at which uh, I thought, um, you know, that the voice was not heard enough. But that let me just fight harder for things that which, uh, yeah, I would say that. Yes, we have always seen you as this fighty, feisty person, you know, holding your, taking a stand and holding it out. So, um, so apart from that, generally looking at the landscape of the industry, do you think there's gender dis discrimination in our industry? And what about sexual harassment, which has become a major issue in the past few years with hashtag Me Too, etc. How do you ensure these things are also taken care of at your establishment now that you run your own business? So we have a zero tolerance policy for uh, any kind of harassment. So when I say sexual harassment or any harassment, and I, I can assure you it is not just uh, a man to woman thing. It's a lot of time it's a woman to man thing as well. So, you know, we build that uh, uh, comfort level where and confidence 
you know, making sure our stylists are aware that it's not going to impact their future or their career if they come up to us and speak to us. Because for us, uh, it's very clearly you have to be comfortable where you're working. And if you're not comfortable and feel at peace and feel threatened and feel, uh, you know, attacked or feel, uh, you know, pressured, that's not okay. And whether you're a junior, whether you're a senior, whether you're a boy, whether you're a girl, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whoever, they, uh, we have a very open door policy to own this. And uh, for us, uh, there is zero tolerance. Um, it's definitely happened within my system as well. But uh, the whole idea is we don't let it pass. We react to it immediately. People are pulled up. We are, uh, they are spoken to. Some of them have lost their jobs. We also make sure that if people are dating each other, they, they cannot work in the same uh, salon. They have to work in a different branch. Uh, which also, if you see, is a lot of corporate uh, policies where they do not have, uh, you know, the husband wife actually uh, work in the same space. But I think it just gets complicated when you bring your personal life onto the shop floor and we try and keep the two things uh, separate. Yeah, I think that's actually a very wise idea given the proximity at which we work in the salons that, uh, you know, um, so yeah. And I think it would be a good thing if somebody gave out a standard, you know, uh, to-do list for salons because there doesn't seem to be any such thing for the industry right now. So moving on to my next question where I'm very curious personally is that, you know, you are this amazingly creative person, you know, and uh, excellent at what you do with hair and and, and now you are an entrepreneur for the last whole decade. So how do you balance these two roles? A, it was extremely difficult in the first few years um, it, because I, th I think as creative people, we are wired very differently. We are wired to see things and there's a lot of emotion attached to everything we do. And uh, the reactions that would come out of a particular situation would be very different for someone who is a non-creative person or not, let me not say non-creative, but someone who's handling management and someone who's handling the creative part of it. Um, so it's been a learning curve, to be honest, and I've had no choice but to adopt it, <laughs> uh, really speaking. Uh, but uh, everything is still pretty much guided by the creative aspect. And the fact that uh, what balances or, uh, you know, the admin, where the admin sees that, you know, uh, we make sense is that we are very clear about uh, one thing, that uh, quality cannot be compromised. We cannot go back on our principles of making sure every stylist working on our shop floor is uh, trained in our system and uh, we will not get into the trap of hiring stylists and changing the uniform and you know expanding and so we are very very clear about uh, those policies uh, so there are some common platforms that uh, are not going to be compromised uh, even if it's uh, from an entrepreneur point of view because i think that keeps the soul of the brand or that keeps, uh, you know, the principles of the brand going. But uh, on the other hand, I've had to, uh, you know, control my reactions to a lot of situations, which uh, it comes very naturally to entrepreneurs. Um, and when you move out of uh, just the creative aspect and handling uh, 30 to 35 people, they are also looking up to you. So you can't lose it. <laughs> you have to, you have to really be measured in uh, how you react to a situation, which might be very obvious to me, but it's not obvious to people who work with you. So yeah, patience is what has uh, a lot of patience is something that's helped me uh, balance this creative and entrepreneur uh, uh, role that I am in cur currently and. Uh, a lot of reflection as well. Whenever anything needs reflection, uh, I go back and say, okay, maybe maybe this could have been done differently. Maybe this could have been handled differently. Maybe, so there is a lot of learning. There's learning every single day. But when I'm into the creative zone or when I'm working with uh, hair, it's every, all of that is detached. I, I mean, I really still, it's back to the base, you know, so. I don't let, let any of those uh, kind of, um, uh, I don't do any reflections or whatever. It is just what it is. <laughs> then in action. Yeah. 
so um so i'll ask you now two, two questions one one would be very business like how do you select the brands you work with now that india has so much choice you know in terms of hair products there was a time when there were maybe a couple of brands or three brands ruling the roost now every day a new brand is being launched and maybe uh, covid 19 has put a break to the you know the flood of flooding of brands in the market but uh, that's what was happening uh, so how have you chosen the brands you want to work with so the brands fundamentally have to reflect one common policy is they are uh, education driven and they are technical driven so brands that have a very common sort of a, a space they don't really work for us uh, but on the other hand we also do a lot of trials we have an academy space so we are open to all the brands but uh, we do strict and there are many factors that go into it one is the weather of goa uh, which is very different compared to the weather of um, delhi um, and uh, considering the moisture levels and considering the humidity so uh, products that work extremely well in other parts of india might not work in goa so that is uh, one secondly it needs to be an education science driven brand it needs to be a technical brand and uh, third is performance at the end of the day they have to perform if they don't perform then uh, you know and that really we just try it out we see what we are using we do half and half and we see if how is this product compared to the other product so we are very honest about brand so even if it's a small boutique brand but we really like it we'll just make sure we push it and make sure that you know it gets its due uh, in the market space because uh, i think it's time to let the smaller brands also uh, come up and be supported if they are really good awesome so um now moving on to your collections uh, you you've done a few and you are always at it in your creativity so and also you carry your look uh, your look is always very sharp and you know your your hair coloring is very special so i am very curious who cuts your hair first of all it's my team <laughs> um uh, so <laughs> i i'm very very particular obviously it's a big stress point for them they are like okay everyone's running away <laughs> when uh, they know that i'm ready for a haircut but uh, the whole idea is um, to be able to apply the system that i so believe in and the system we work in and my team has been trained in so i'm very comfortable getting it done from uh, the members of my team and uh, they are all um, you know they work with me i know that i need more specifications for my hair but they are very happy to oblige and you know i'm very thankful for that fantastic we know we always look forward to new collections from you know star hairdressers like you uh, so what how how do you go about your collections are there as there anything coming up can i can we get some scoop from you So Ritu I think like you had mentioned earlier the whole industry is changing right uh, when we were in the print media or when we were heavily into uh, offline kind of uh, situations the concept of collections was huge but that has undergone huge change now i mean um, everyone's consuming material on the, the screen right which uh, basically is almost instant everything is instant So for me it's like creating collections on real people so what i do now is get uh, sort of real people involved in my collections and it's happening throughout the year it's no more uh, you know that one collection of the year because trends are changing so fast um, you know the whole global community is coming together of hairdressers trends are uh, what are happening here what are happening internationally they can be in february while i might be i i would have shot in december and you know i would have to wait for one whole year for the trend it's not that anymore so trends are uh, you know changing and uh, we are adopting it and we have and we have a program called ambassadors of change uh, that we uh, run during this time uh, which uh, there've been very good transformations that we've done uh, for all these little you know um, girls and uh, you know it, it's just a very different way of looking at hair art now uh, so it's no more of 
three models, one guy, you know, three female models, one guy, and let's put out that this is a collection. So it is being churned out much more regularly and it's more real. It is not so photoshopped. It is not, you know, under very controlled environments. There's a certain reality to the pictures. And I'm loving it, to be honest. I mean, so for me, it gives me more freedom to experiment with my work, my art, my skill, and just put it out there, you know, rather than uh, doing it in very controlled fashion. I think that, for me, that time is gone now. Sure, sure, absolutely makes sense. So uh, can you just tell a, a little bit more in a couple of lines about your uh, uh, ambassadors of change or this whole trend that you are uh, So ambassadors of change is specifically uh, people who are social media influencers mm -hmm. and uh, they are out a lot in the, in the space that uh, we would like to see them in. They have to work for our kind of brand. Uh, they are cool. They are modern. They are young. They are full of energy. They, you know, wear their hair, uh, you know, very well. They are happy to experiment. Uh, so these are our ambassadors of change. So we put them out in the market with our work and uh, they are spreading our, our kind of hairdressing. You know, people look at their hair and they say, wow, we love your hair. Yeah. And for me, that's a real test of uh, you know good hairdressing so we we started this about five years uh, sorry we started it with five models about a year and a half ago and uh, then we took a break because it was too hectic but we keep doing uh, stuff like I, I think uh, my uh, uh, Tabasum has shared a mullet image yes. with you so that was the last one we did um, which she's actually the same model who we did a collection with two mm -hmm. years ago where she had hair this long. Then we did a pixie for her with uh, in association with Wall. And uh, we've now done a mullet for her. So she's been, you know, rotating her looks. She's been wearing different looks on her. And she can't get over it. The people who she associates with, she parties, she goes out with, you know, they're all it's becoming a community in that sense and it's real right because she is wearing it it's not like she is there's no undoing and doing this is what it is as editors it's almost magical for us to see how you guys just transform one face to in, you know and you with one color and a stroke of you know your scissors you just you know convert the looks into something else altogether it's really magical indeed thank you so, so um Going on to your uh, initiative in education, uh, you know, you, uh, skilling, especially in our industry, has become a major, you know, there's been a major drive all across. And so what is it that uh, you've been doing on this front? I know that you have an academy very successfully run. So what are your plans with that? Oh, we have something very huge in the pipeline, Ritu. Hopefully, if that comes through. We, you would be the first person to know about it. Uh, but of course, like everything else that's going on, um, our education is going to be a lot online now, but different to what is existing in the market. I mean, what, uh, still what is existing in the market, and a lot of videos are look and learn. It doesn't really, and it's meant for hairdressers. And it's still, I feel, if I wasn't a hairdresser, I would not understand this. Uh, very well. And uh, I do see a lot of videos or a lot of academies online that are also directed to beginners. Mm -hmm. But I just feel that, you know, there is no comprehensive. So for me, I look at hairdressing, if I look at my history, and I go back, if I had a choice to even try this out when I was in school, I would have been a much happier person rather, you know, traumatizing myself trying 10 different things through the five years of undergrad and postgrad. And, you know, then coming on, accidentally and you know figuring it out and then I was lucky to do the right things at the right time not everyone is lucky to do that if I had a chance to try the skill out and figure out if this is what I would be interested in and make a career out of it I think my path would have been different but the time is uh, the right time now I mean so I don't know if um, uh, there, there has been uh, the, the, the new education policy by the government lets you try out vocational subjects right in school, starting at standard level seven or eight. And I'm looking at that. I mean, I'm looking at, uh, uh, you know, entering education where a kid 
by looking at the videos uh, or me teaching the videos can actually practice the skill and learn it and decide whether that is a choice that they might want to consider. And, uh, you know, so the, the, we are working around those lines uh, and we are in the middle of shooting those videos. So it's almost like uh, education driven videos, which are not look and learn videos. So let's see how that goes. Awesome. All the best to you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Bina, of course, uh, coming back to one question that we're asking everyone now is, you know, the last past two years have been like, uh, have smashed the, uh, the entire, I mean, the world in its face. And we have had to relearn everything, you know, and uh, whether it's any industry, media or hairdressing, beauty. So we would love to know what were your learnings and how was it for you? Uh, it was tough. It was really tough. I mean, after after the first lockdown, I mean, I'm sure everyone would have realized all of us did what we could in the first lockdown, education and so many other things. But that also becomes, you know, after a point, what do you do with that? You know, if you're not really going to be able to go and work in a place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, what we did with uh, the time of the lockdown is just evaluate where are we going you know, let's let's really look at things in reality and not fool ourselves, not, you know, uh, you know, and it, there is no shame in accepting that this is what it is, you know, um, however big you are, however small, I think people want to keep it real. They want to go to places that, uh, you know, have enough um, security, protection for their health, but also at the same time, I think gone are the days for uh, luxury, at least for some time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, it's the end of it. That would be like really sad. But I think uh, the concept of luxury has been turned around on its head. And uh, I think salon should wake up and understand what needs to be invested in and what, where do you need to invest in? because everything that needed to go online is going online and it's going much faster online than people had anticipated. But uh, in our industry, I think uh, people have to make sure that their setup costs are really under control, uh, make sure that they have a strong education backing to their brand because, uh, you know, you need to have uh, the ability to, uh, you know, replace a hairdresser or a beauty therapist in a market like this, where either they work with you or you have someone else ready to take their place. But for a brand, it's very important to, you know, account for all of these things and much more. Uh, and yeah, so and uh, the other thing that really helped me is uh, getting help from a younger generation. I, uh, they just keep you you know, in loop of what's going on around you. So I work very closely with, uh, so someone who's helping us shoot our videos for education is a really young boy. And so is the person who is uh, helping me with my social media. So rather than doing everything myself, I'm trying to get help from a much younger generation. They have, they understand what's going on now. They also help me out with, you know, multiple things going around so I can focus on what I am good at rather than, you know, trying to, you know, handle social media and handle the shooting of the videos. We used to do everything ourselves first and that sort of became really exhausting. So we've made sure that we've actually invested in the right places rather than cutting investments completely, which is what people are doing right now. They're cutting investments, but that... I think putting the money in the right places, education, working with younger people, understanding your brand positioning, what you want to do is these are things that need evaluation more often than before. So that's what we are. Fantastic. Yeah, that again makes a lot of sense that, you know, you're investing and you're encouraging the younger generation. And of course, we, uh, when it comes to tech, then we definitely need them by our sides today. Yeah. So, uh, Bina, finally, we have this fun space where we talk about, uh, you know, our guests. We, are, we try to figure out what are their hairdressing, you know, wellness choices they make. Like you are being a hairdresser. And the concern always is with, you know, all the consumers you talk to is, oh, my hair gets very dry with 
you know, so much color and the usual questions, you know. So we would love to know how do you take care of your hair and what do you do with your skin and what's your favorite fragrance in the oil? So if you can share and if you don't mind, we would love sure. to hear. I mean, I fundamentally keep it simple. I do major transformations in for my hair two or three times a year. Um, I'm not uh, someone who sits, though I own a salon, I'm not sitting in the chair all the time. But I do make sure that I'm using really high quality shampoo, conditioners, leave-in and serums. So th these are non-negotiables for uh, being able to maintain good hair and you will hear a lot of people say oh i use all this but still my hair is not okay which i think is just a matter of knowing uh, picking the right product and knowing what to do with the product for example people use serum in wet hair and they expect it to take away the frizz it's never going to do that so you have a lot of these uh, myths that are going around in the market as well so uh, that's my simple routine with hair care I do use, uh, I do treatments maybe one and a half, uh, once in one and a half or two months. Uh, that's just moisture treatments or repair treatments for my hair. So uh, with skin, literally uh, a face wash and a cream. I don't do anything else. I do face massage. If I, I like uh, to do a face mas massage with very simple products. Um, Non-intrusive, no nothing heavy, no peels, none of that. I don't like that uh, for my skin at all. So keeping it simple, uh, both in terms of hair and skin. Uh, products I use for my skin are Dermalogica for facials. Um, and uh, I do use a Cetaphil face wash, which is like an exfoliant. And uh, I also use the mud mask for uh, from time to time. So again, uh, keeping it uh, simple, but uh, face wash, cleansing, and just a face massage once in a way is what I do for my skin. And in terms of hair, I like experimenting a lot with my hair. So um, I have to like take care of it. Uh, so the products I use for my hair are from Olaplex to Rene Future to Biotop and a mix of all of this. So. And what about the fragrances? Do you, do you have any favorites? Uh, yeah, I like Thierry Mugler. I like Gucci. I like, um, I, and there was this fragrance that was created uh, by uh, one of the perfumers for me, which I was, uh, so there's no name to it, but it was a customized fragrance and I really loved it. So I like um, lavender a lot in, in fragrances and I like uh, cucumber. And so these are, I don't like very spicy perfumes. I don't like very strong perfumes, but I like perfumes that uh, are like uh, the, the ones that Celine does. So those, those are the scents I use. Fantastic. And uh, given that, you know, you have, uh, you know, you're up on your feet most of the time and, you know, so what is the fitness, I mean, in terms of keeping yourself fit and, you know, I have heard, and I know that hairdressers have, uh, when you're cutting hair and you have these problems with the, with the bones and so on. So how do you take care that, you know, you're pr protected? So when I'm actually cutting hair, that is uh, my meditation because I completely uh, get into my work and it's almost like I don't know what's going around me. But I don't do that meditation or yoga offline. I mean, I, I, I'm more into someone who does a sport. So currently I'm, uh, I have enrolled myself for a badminton with a professional badminton coach. And that's what I do thrice a week. I do go for a swim once in a while. Yeah, but that's, that's what I do. Fantastic. So nice to get to know about, you know, what you guys do because you're specialists and you would know what to do, what suits you best, right? So, yeah, I think everyone's an individual. So I think uh, the most important thing is for hairdressers to remember that when you're working, the posture needs to be right, you know, because that can, you're standing on your feet for eight hours a day. And if you're not aware of your body and your posture at that given time, it can lead to a lot of aches and pains. Um, I have been uh, cutting hair for almost 20 years now, but, uh, you know, I mean, I do have uh, the occasional aches and pains, but I, I, would put that to my choice of footwear. It's like, um, you know, I, I love heels and I do wear them, though it's a disaster for hairdressers to wear heels. But there are there are some dresses that you want to wear heels with. And 
you know, I've done those things. But um, apart from that, if you're aware of your posture when you're cutting or styling hair or doing makeup, I think uh, it takes care of most of the issues. But otherwise, in terms of maintenance and lifestyle, I think everyone's, uh, everyone is different and their um, temperaments are different and what they want to achieve out of their workout is different. So it's something that... Um, very personal. Yeah, very personal. Um, finally, is there anything, any advice you would like to come uh, to give to the budding, uh, you know, hairdressers joining the industry and especially post-COVID, anything that you'd like to tell them? I, what I feel is um, the budding hairdressers, the most important thing is to focus on the skill rather than the fashion part of it. When I say fashion is the, the whole, um, you know, I want to look like a hairdresser and I want to wear brands and I want to wear a cool t-shirt. Yes, that all is good, but that really comes in after you have mastered your skills. And I feel that... Uh, you know, uh, swinging scissors and, you know, uh, being very confident about your personality and wearing great clothes doesn't make you the most skilled person. So I feel spending time in really, really mastering a skill and having that patience is what I would advise most hairdressers to do because I meet a lot of them. I meet people with four or five years of experience who cannot shampoo and blow dry hair properly because they haven't been drilled with the idea is that's the first step of hairdressing. Cutting hair comes much later. You first need to get your basics right. So there's a lot of this going on in the industry where uh, they feel that, you know, there was this point where your personality is so important, how you look is so important, how you hold your scissor is so important, how you, you know, how you uh, flick your scissor is so important. And I feel everyone got caught up in that, you know, and uh, it's still there. So that, that's exactly the reason also we had a separate brand <laughs> or mm -hmm. something that moved away from, you know, all the noise and focuses on the skill. And then, of course, all this really helps how you present yourself, how you, what you wear, how you do it. But that cannot be your starting point. Yes, absolutely. And I think the Internet has also done that. We know that, you know, uh, it's yeah. uh, the superficial things, unfortunately, have become more important. Yeah. Then the fundamentals, you know, strengthening your fundamentals day after day, coming to work on time and practicing and so on. And doing the most boring things, you know, it might be the most boring thing to do, but you have to do it in order to do it. And that's true in anything. It's not just hairdressing. I'm sure cricketers feel that when they have to hit one shot hundred times in a day to be able to hit it properly. Or when I play badminton, you know, I, for the whole session of one hour, I just have to serve correctly, I have to put my feet properly, I have to hold my racket properly. It's true with any field. It is there is no glamour to any field when you, you know, break down the the real aspect of it. The glamour is an outcome. It is not the beginning. And I think in the selfie generation that we are living in, it it can be uh, you know, detrimental if not brought to notice and, you know, said, you know, this is not okay. Sorry, but there's one more thing with hair. I mean, that is the other thing with the whole onslaught of uh, pictures which are styled with tongue and, you know, filtered and, you know, put up. And you don't, that hair can really look awful, you know, when it's not on the internet or it's not been processed or it's not been filtered, right? So it's, it's this whole ecosystem that is, uh, I think, pressurizing the hairdresser as well to be a certain way and to do things a certain way which, you know, is shortcutting the skills, unfortunately. Absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, you, four, you, you have four salons in uh, Goa. Uh, do, you, do you see yourself franchising in the future? Do you see yourself getting out of your uh, Goa and uh, setting up outside Goa as well? So we've had these conversations, to be honest, from time to time, because uh, we do have a lot of clients from all over India coming to go out to get their hair down with us, uh, uh, traveling specifically to get. So it's always been a question mark. And I have always been of the opinion that until I know what's going on on the shop floor, I will not be able to take that step. So that's the other thing COVID's done for us, Ritu, and in a very positive way is to be able to use technology very efficiently 
I'm more in a position now to be able to confidently answer that question that maybe that could be an option because uh, we have a system and process in place that lets me, uh, you know, log into all my uh, branches, be able to do education more seamlessly, uh, be able to uh, pass on the philosophy more seamlessly every morning. Uh, so for me, you know, technology will possibly make this possible for us to be able to move because otherwise it will always be, be now you can't be in all the branches simultaneously, right? And uh, your brand is all about education and it's all about you. And I said, no, but we have a system and, you know, everyone works in the same way, but how do you keep that up? How do you manage that? So all these were questions that uh, we couldn't, and though we had WhatsApp, but we never thought of it until COVID that you could actually do trainings online. So now that has changed and um, there could be a possibility. So, so thank you, Bina Punjani, for joining us today. And uh, all the best for all your future ventures. Let's stay connected uh, with all the scoops that we could get. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to future chats with you. Thank you so much. Same here. Thank you for having me. Lovely chatting. Thank you.